Shall we begin? Why not? Welcome to Frankie Sense and More. It's like she's got a whole lot of goodness for you with a little bit of sass. Frankie, did you just say... She sure did. Not to mention, <laughs> along with... <laughs> Whoops. Join us now as Frankie Picasso and her new co-host mix it up with authors, musicians, and interviews with world-changing people. Let's begin now. Okay, let's begin now, because it only makes sense. Hello there, and welcome to Frankie Sense and More. How's it going? Well, I was away on holidays, as you all know, and I'm back, refreshed, tanned, and enjoying uh, this respite that we have from the winter. <laughs> it's actually, I don't know, uh, I don't know, I can't translate the Celsius to Fahrenheit for you guys, but it's like 15 or something out there today. So it's pretty, pretty warm uh, for the Great White North, as they say. Uh, today we have author Mary Kelly stopping by as part of her book tour. She is promoting her book, The Weeping Angel, Letters and Poems from World War I, France Letters that her father, H.W. Kelly, wrote. And later we're going to go to the Oscars with the TGRN's movie correspondent, Brent Marchand, for his predictions. And if you want to make your own predictions on air, call us at 903-787-5887. And if you get more right than Brent, I'm going to send you a free book. So how about that? <laughs> but first, you know, this this year on March the 8th, people around the world are going to be raising awareness about International Women's Day. And this year is no different, except that the organizers from Women's March uh, from Washington are planning another strike for that very day. They got a lot of ladies out the first time, and they're hoping to get a lot more out this time. It's going to be called A Day Without Women. You know, Donald Trump has been doing some funny, silly things lately, as you all know. Um, and <laughs> one of those things was not so funny was to put into uh, place these these new rules and regulations about um, immigrants. So I was so proud and happy to read that the, and I think, Mary, you're going to like this if you haven't read it, the Davis Museum in Wellesley, Massachusetts, has gaping blank spaces on its walls, empty podiums, and they've shrouded pieces of work after they removed and, co after they removed and covered all of the artwork that has been created and donated by immigrants. It's the artless movement, and it aims to provide a visual representation of cultural contributions that immigrants have made to the U.S. and the gaps that would be left without them, and I'm sure they're very big and very wide. Um, Mary was... Uh, I said that she probably would be interested because as a former Broadway theater manager and a nonprofit arts administrator and consultant with the field organization, um, you know, I guess you have a, a, the arts must be near and dear to your heart as well. Now, you have written uh, memoir and fiction, and this is your first published book, and it is the memories and memoirs and letters and poems as I said before, written by your father, H.W. Kelly. Now, Mary received boxes of, of these letters from family, and she, I guess they didn't know what to do with them, and she has gone through them and annotated them and turned them into a wonderful historical, actually, book um, of what it was like to be at the front during the Great War. So welcome, Mary. You can tell us much oh. more about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Oh, it's great to be here. And I, I don't want to mention, I was also head of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, so I know oh, the that's right. Museum yes. well. And yes. uh, I, uh, I certainly uh, uh, sympathize with this, this showing of uh, what happens when the art of our immigrants is not included. It's, it's a, a bereft world, anyway. It um, was, and it is. And, you know, we, they've done so much, and, and as I, you know, I've clearly stated on this show. And Frankie Spence is, is loosely aligned with the United Nations Global Goals. So one of those goals, of, of course, is, um, is you know, equality for women. But the other is is really just human rights and, and the fact that, you know, we're not treating people like human beings, people that are just like us. It's mind boggling to me. But that's another day yeah. for another day. You are on a tour to promote your new book, The Weeping Angel, Letters and Poems from World War One, One France. Now, you only met your father once, I believe, when you were 15. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Um, next, what next happened? Meeting was, well, well it was, I was 
glad to do it. Uh, obviously, you know, a girl without a father is, is usually looking for one. <laughs> and uh, I was fortunate. My mother didn't want us to get together, and it, it was, I was getting mixed messages on all of that. And my father just happened to call my home one night when she was out. And that's how we met on the phone. And he came in about two weeks later. Um, uh, and, and we had a terrific evening together, frankly. It was, you know, two hours of, uh, mutual adoration. So that was great. Uh, then, uh, these letters arrived. Um, and I started transcribing them because, uh, you after know. After his death, right? Yeah, after all, yeah. long after his death. Yeah. yeah, several years ago. He he died in 1959. He died just a few months after I met him. Oh. Um, wow. Yeah, and I actually I met some of my half brothers at his funeral. Uh, oh, but, interesting. Excuse me. I said that was interesting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the letters arrived, and I started reading them, and they were in kind of a hodgepodge. They weren't in any order. And I wanted to get into them more, and so I started typing them out. And I had no intention of doing a book at that point. But the more I got into the letters, um, and there's nothing like typing out something to really begin to understand it, you know, and and Mm -hmm. be more curious about it. Uh, The more I got into it, the more I wanted to know what was happening in the war at that point, where he was. Uh, and I went out to Kansas City to the World War One Museum. Uh, I had a friend out there, and um, uh, and did uh, delved into their collection. Uh, it's an it's a terrific place, and I found a book written by his commanding officer, which detailed every place they were and when they were there and what was happening in the war and what battle was going on. And I found that book on eBay. Uh, I'd seen it in the in the World War One Museum in their reference section. Mm-hmm. I found it on eBay and um, and started, you know, taking the letters and comparing them with what Colonel Laird wrote about what was going on. So that was fascinating. I was able to, you know, through a map in the book, I was able to, which I included in my book, uh, I was able to trace the the route that they took and and Absolutely. you know the hour, hours of marching and so forth. So your, your uh, dad, I, your, your, wait, wait, one second. Yeah. Your dad grew up in Kansas. That's where he was from. Kansas and City, right. he, yeah. like many young, Kansas City, yeah. And so like many young men of, of the time, they, they thought war was a great adventure. And oh. they couldn't wait to sign up and go for some ungodly reason. And and that, that was him. He thought, he looked at it as a big adventure and, and a growing yeah. up experience. Yeah, he, he said to his mother, you know, now I'm really going to begin to live. This is uh, the experience of my life. And I yeah. think it actually was the experience of his life, but not not the way he thought about it. Then, yeah, probably. Uh, eh? So he, he, he joined the 12th Engineers. They were like the first ones out. And he was a, uh, he was he was slight, wasn't he, of build? Yes. And yes. so the, the, the way that he could join was he bec- he was the bugler, although he couldn't play yeah. a bugle. <laughs> <laughs> right, the but they gave him lessons, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And he went into he went in and as a bugler, of course, he didn't do very well with the bugle. He he wrote later that people would beg him to stop playing. Um, That's hilarious. Because they, they but his company so, was building railroad tracks. That's what they were yes. out there to do. Yes. Is that correct? They, to France. They were, that's correct. They were maintaining them, building them, and as fast as they were blown up by the enemy, they went in and. Uh, tried to put them back together again. Um, they also brought uh, ammunition and material up to the front line. So they were right, you know, right behind the front line, um, which gave him an opportunity to see all sides of the war, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and I, I found it interesting that um, he, I, I guess because at the time there's nothing else to do but write letters and, and any information was appreciated. Anything to read was appreciated. All of that was, you know, just because of where they were in the middle of, you know, a war. Um, but he was kind of a, a, a literary snob even back as a young boy. And he described a letter from a young woman who was 18 years old from, from Britain. And he said, you know, he talked about how 
ahead of her years she was because of the words that she used in the letter and how she wrote. And I mean, he later became a journalist, but, but I, I found that interesting. Did you? I, I found it fascinating. I mean, he, he became the regimental poet. He yes. wrote a lot of poetry over there. Um, and poetry, which kind of demonstrated the, you know, what he expected and what was really there. Um, uh, and yes, he, he. I guess he was. A, he read voraciously. He read mm-hmm. everything anybody sent him, and he was like that the, his whole life. Um, and yes, when he returned, he became a reporter at the Kansas City Star, and he was there for oh a good eight to ten years, and then he moved east uh, to New York to uh, work for American Magazine as an editor. What did so. what kind of what kind of um, reporting did he do at the at the Star? Like what was his beat? Uh, Oh, at the store, it was mainly covering the beat. You know, most okay. of his most of his more well known work was done at American Magazine, where he, uh, you know, uh, wrote. He was a ghostwriter for Ed J. Edgar Hoover and Eddie Rickenbacker and Shirley oh, wow. Temple's mother. Uh, he covered the uh, Battle of the Bulge in the Second World War. Uh, he interviewed Einstein and the um, and he covered the Dion quintuplets. So he was, you know, he was he right was there, there on the pulse. Yeah. 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 Wow. What a shame that, that you couldn't have grown up with this man. But you, you, you found out a lot about him, and that's pretty cool. And and your step siblings did do they have memories and and um, more well, information for him. you? Did they, they all, as a person? Yeah. yeah. Yes, they yeah. all knew him. My my brother, in fact, went and uh, lived with him during his high school years. My my. I have several brothers, but yes. this one is um, seven years older than I am. So uh, uh, he has, you know, many memories of, of his father. And uh, uh, he, too, is a writer. <laughs> well, uh, runs in the family. Too. We're going to go to a yeah. commercial break in just a moment, yep. um, Mary. But but when we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit more about, about your father's adventures. And maybe if you can find a poem that you'd like to read for us, that would be really great. It seems like poetry is, yeah. is a dead art. I don't know. We don't hear so much about people writing poems today as, as as they used to. It used to be a profession where, you know, people were quite revered. Don't go anywhere. We are coming right back. Okay. It's Frankie Sensenmore, more and a little bit later, Brent Marchand will be with us to talk about the Oscars. Heck no, we're just getting warmed up. Frankie Sensenmore and more will be right back after we pay the bills. It's March. Here, the United States Postal Service successfully ships over 160 billion packages and letters, with bills traveling through the mail at twice the speed of checks. Automated sorting machines read zip codes and directs the mail to the proper destination. But last year, they failed to read some 2.4 billion pieces of mail, all because of cacography. That's bad handwriting. So what happens to all that errant mail? The post office hires more than 700 postal clerks to decipher the most difficult ones. When a sorting machine discovers an illegible address, it scans and sends a digital image to the clerk's computers. Amazingly, the average clerk can crack the code in just three seconds. Not everyone can keep up, though, as management at the post office is always pushing the envelope. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert Annette Hammond. According to Weight Watchers, people who are overweight or obese are 60 to 90 percent more likely to develop type 2 diabetes as those who are not. Weight matters, and what you eat is vital to your outcome. The facts show that 35 percent of Americans, which is roughly 79 million, over the age of 20, have pre-diabetic blood sugar levels. If you are at risk of acquiring type 2 diabetes, you need to make changes in your diet and exercise. They report that losing weight, stepping up your physical activity, and eating a well-balanced diet are all critical to staving off or controlling diabetes. Diabetes is not something you want to mess around with. Keep your health and exercise a priority in your life and keep diabetes away. I'm Annette Hammond. To hear more fitness and weight loss tips, visit our website at AnnetteHammond.com.
And we're back at Frankie Sense and More. I am your host, Frankie Picasso, and we're here today with Mary Kelly, who is uh, on a book tour. The book is uh, written, really, by her father, Hubert W. Kelly. They're his letters and poems from World War I and when he was away with his regiment, the 12th, uh, over in, in France. So, Mary, just before we went on break, I asked you if you'd like to read a poem and or share a poem with us from, from the book, and I think you might have found one. Sure, yes. Um, this was written, uh, he arrived in, in France in, in uh, uh, 17, 1917, and uh, in the fall, he, he arrived there in the summer, and he mm-hmm. wrote this poem in the fall, and it's called The Road to Roiselle. And it was published in the New York Herald, actually, in the winter of 1918. Um, I have heard that gypsies dwell down the road to Fair Roiselle. Tell me true, is this the way? Surely I have gone astray. I have heard that gypsy song rings the happy way along. This is not the road I know. Why shouldn't they have told me so? I have heard that magpies flew black and white in skies of blue. Surely this is not the way. Ravens wing the dismal gray. I have heard the fields were all flowered as a gypsy shawl. This is not the road they mean. Not a blossom have I seen. I have often heard them tell of the road to Fair Roiselle. Nothing did they say, I know, of these crosses row on row. Who has strung that tangled wire, blackened hedge and tree with fire? Is it thunder that I hear? This is not the road, I fear. Not a thrill of laughter gay. Surely this is not the way. Tangled hedge and crumbled wall. This is not the way at all. There is not a gypsy throng, ne'er a strain from gypsy song. Only ranks of marching men. I must turn me back again. That's the poem. I love I love that turn of phrase in, in flowered like a gypsy shawl. And I can just see that shawl, too. You know, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. 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 And I know that, that he wrote a lot of letters home about how he um, – he would go out with his friend and, and they would ask for directions and, and people would send them the wrong way or didn't know on yes, purpose. Yes. Yeah. 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 They've got a kick out of watching these Yankees, you know, march off into or go in circles, actually. It's often they sent them in circles. Yeah. I guess they got a kick out of that. Yeah. But they, they appreciate it. Just guys. like in Quebec here, you know, it seemed that they appreciated when they tried to speak the language and were a little more helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know when they when they were speaking French, and he 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 said that he would have like um, I guess his sister was learning French back home, and yes, he yes. wanted to send her some books and yeah. Yes, he bought the books. That's nice. Books he had he um, to... a very special relationship with Sam because you know he he was very dedicated to writing her letters. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, he would uh, write daily I... almost. Yeah. Uh, That's it, incredible. It, and I think as you and and he expected her to share them with everyone. You know, um, he has some letters in here to the uh, to his sisters and and a couple to his father, but uh, it was mainly his mother. And and he said, I hope you'll share these with everyone. Uh, so it was an you know an account. What was interesting too to me about these letters is that. He couldn't say where he was. He was just in France, as far as they were concerned. He had, they had no idea where he was in France. And, of course, the censors prevented the soldiers from saying anything about where they were uh, and what was actually happening outside. So some of the letters are a little lighthearted, where you, and then you read that there was a big battle that happened the day before. Yeah. And, and it takes you aback. You, know, you, you realize that he couldn't write about what was really happening. and uh, But he was trying to keep their spirits up back home and say, don't worry, you know, everything's fine here. I'll be home soon. Uh, yeah, and, and, he, gets... and he talked a lot about, you know, don't listen to the rumors. We hear rumors. There's just rumors. Like, you know, don't yeah, get all in a big, tell mom not to get all scared and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which, which was really sweet. Um, and what, and what did his dad do? Too. What did your grandfather do? Because he did, what, did he own a newspaper? It sounded like he owned a newspaper. No, his 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 father uh, uh, actually went down to New Orleans uh, during the war to work on in the shipyard, 
Oh, okay. Um, and uh, he uh, helped them. He was a master engineer, so, you know, he was doing oh, what master okay. engineers do. Uh, in the in the shipyard down there. Because so one of the away. letters he said, you know, Dad, it's a, you know, if you want to use it, you can use whatever of my poems or letters you want. You know, he kind of said yes. that. So I got the feeling that maybe he owned a newspaper or had a paper um, that, and he was just giving her permission to to uh, to print. Well, but his he, uncle I, Hamp did own uh, did oh, take over a okay. paper, and I think he was hoping that his father would send stuff to his uncle so okay yeah and i mean you're in the middle of the great war you're in the middle of france and they're entering you know literary contests in new york city like for poetry and stuff i thought that was really interesting yeah yeah his poems were in a book of world war one poetry um and uh he wrote to the guy who who edited it and thanked him um he i think he just what this war did with him, anyways, he discovered he was a writer. You know, yeah. he started writing these letters and writing the poems and getting good feedback. I think that was so important to him uh, to be able to think this was all going to lead to something. You know, no, he never went to you, college. Yeah, I think you said one of your stepbrothers sent you that that box. Right. And what do they think today? Now that you've you've put this into a, a, an, an amazing book. Well, he thanked me very much. You know, I think it means a lot to all of us to have this as a, you know, uh, I, originally when I typed it, that's what I was going to do is just send a copy to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But th this has meant more. And I had these two wonderful uh, historians read the book before I issued it. And, um, and they found it, which was very gratifying to me. Um, Steve Trout from the University of Southern Alabama and Chris mm -hmm. Capazola here here at MIT. I mean, they found the collection very striking because it's unusual to have this many letters uh, uh, in in one collection. Um, yeah, he he was a prolific also, writer. So I guess I was. guess your mom saved everything, or his mom. His mom did. Yeah, his your mom grandmother saved yeah. everything. I you know I'm sorry I don't have her letters. I'd love to know what was coming back to him yeah. but uh as he writes in the book you know many of them were lost because they'd have to pull up camp and start marching and they you know they could only take what they had in their backpack yeah. um so uh that that part we don't have but along with it you know i got his dog tags and his uh a lot of other stuff uh his uh his uh Passport to Mexico and his war correspondent pass. Uh, he really kept everything, uh, wow. which for which I was very grateful. You know. Yeah, yeah. I can just understand. I can just you know really feel how you would feel very close to him and come to know him in in a little you know obviously uh, more so than you did and just find out who he was as a person. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. He led a he led quite a life, and um, as I said, he was he was over there in World War II. He was horrified. At the end of the book, I I put a piece in there mm -hmm. that was never published. Um, it says on the top of it, "Waiting for State Department approval." Uh, but about the pain that he really felt and what he saw after World War II in France, and mm -hmm. how the people in France had nothing, and the women were wearing cardboard shoes. And he felt there was a misunderstanding here in the United States about the effect of what the war, the effect of the war on the populace. Um, yeah. So um, he he carried this, and he kept in touch with these guys from the twelfth uh, for his entire life. I mean, in the nineteen fifties. Yeah, in the nineteen fifties, he was writing them letters and uh, so forth. So. You know, Were you was, able to meet? Were was, any of them still alive when you started writing? No, unfortunately, no. no. Um, Were you able so. to? Did you get in touch with any of the families and, and see if they had letters or anything? I didn't. I didn't, and I didn't have their. Na I don't have their names. I just know he kept in touch with oh. them. Uh, he kept okay. in touch with with one gentleman who I knew as a child. Uh, oh. Clarence Woodbury, who became a reporter for the Daily News in New York. And um, Clarence was in the 11th Engineers, um, 
and my father and he were in touch for their entire lives, you know. Uh, and in fact, Clarence published, got something, a poem that my father had written. And my father wasn't well at the end of his life. He'd had a stroke and uh, he was, you know, just not able to do what he had been doing. Um, but uh, Clarence got some of his work published in the American Legion magazine, which I think probably gave my father a lot of, you know, uh, a lot Chaché. of pleasure. Yeah. 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 So, wow. but uh, is there is there I a think, um, an organization of, of of I guess there's a there is an organization of war correspondence. Yeah, I haven't actually looked at that. I mean, there are a lot of World War One associations. You know, many most of them in Great Britain because that's you know Great Britain really took the hit um, right. during World War One. I. I mean, as he as my father wrote when he got there, you know, there were no young men left. I mean, yeah, they were yeah. all. Uh, Even Churchill went off all. as a war correspondent. I remember he he was so excited yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I um, I just have to. I'm I'm still pursuing things, you know. But uh, this you? is where it, it all started. I did go to Amiens. Yes. And I did go see the Weeping Angel, the little statue that he writes about, um, very eloquently, actually, 13 years after the war. Remember? Yeah, tell us, tell us, tell the, tell the listeners about that because you did name the book after the Weeping Angel, and right. And so tell us before you go what that relationship was, what it meant. We've got well, one minute. The, it became uh, it became a symbol for World War One soldiers because it's a okay. statue that was done in 1636. But it, one hand is on the skull and the other hand is on the hourglass, and it's a little tiny statue in the back of the church over a, a, a casket of a, a gentleman, and he the the uh, the symbol is you know oh time and death. I mean life is brief. Uh, that's really mm -hmm. what, what it meant, and it was. It became a postcard. It was sent to uh, many uh, people during the war, and I actually bought a po that postcard on eBay. Um, oh wow! Wow! Yeah. Well, Mary, Mary, I just want to say thank you for stopping by today on your tour. Oh. Folks, Pleasure. you can buy The Weeping Angel: Letters and Poems from World War One France by H. W. Kelly on Amazon. You can buy it at Amazon.ca, Amazon.com. And when we come back from our break, we are going to the Oscars. Thanks again, Mary. No, thank you. Appreciate it. We're just getting warmed up. Frankie Sense and more will be right back after we pay the bills. It's marching down the Did you know you can burn as many calories in 45 minutes of yard work as in 30 minutes of aerobics? Yard work is a total body workout consisting of pushing, pulling, lifting, and carrying. Using a push mower alone can burn 300 to 500 calories in an hour. Raking and bagging with a pooking fork, that's a fork often used in gardening, burns about 330 calories per hour. Cleaning and digging with the dibble, that little hand spade, can burn approximately 400 calories an hour. Stay fit by horb gorbling. That's just puttering around the yard. To me, a perfect summer day is when the sun is shining, the birds are singing, and the lawnmower is broken. It's marching day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Our bodies were created to function properly, and all we need is available to us to live a healthy, long life. We have been fearfully and wonderfully made and equipped with what we need to live life to the fullest. According to Medical News Today, the body ensures that a constant level of energy is available to all of its cells through a complex system that includes regulating how much food we eat, how much of the digestive food we absorb, how much of the digestive food we store away, and how much of our energy store we release for use. If this balance is upset, individuals can gain weight and even develop type 2 diabetes. But it really is simple to maintain optimal health. Exercise at least an hour a day, keep portion sizes small, and consume nutritious, low-calorie foods to live a healthy, long life. I'm Annette Hammond. And we're back, and I told you we're going to be back with the Good Radio Network's 
movie correspondent Brent Marchand, and we are going to the Oscars. So we're going to hear all about the movies that are up, all about the best actors, actresses, supporting role players, all of that great stuff. And if you would like to join us, 903-787-5887. So give us a call and you can give us your prediction. And as I stated earlier, if you beat Brent, if you have more correct than he does, we will send you a book. <laughs> so feel free to call us. Brent, hey, Brent hey, the Frankie. Movies. I'm so excited. I just love movies, as you know. And uh, we get a lot of joy, you and I, out of watching them. Well, uh, for people who review movies, this is like the high holidays. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for the cinephiles, yes, <laughs> the high holidays. I love it. That's so funny. Okay, well, let's see. So we 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 have the field, the best actor, best movie. Where should we start? Best movie, best actor. Well, let's start with that. Let's say, let's start with best actor. Um, okay. Uh, the field in this race includes uh, Casey Affleck for Manchester by the Sea, mm -hmm. Ryan Gosling for La La Land, Viggo Mortensen for Captain Fantastic, Denzel Washington for Fences, and Andrew Garfield for Hacksaw Ridge. And the way I see it right now, it's a it's a, a toss-up between Casey Affleck and Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Before the season started, Casey Affleck was considered sort of the prohibitive favorite to win. But over the course of awards season, an off-screen controversy has arisen that's kind of tarnished his halo a little bit. He's taken home quite a few awards, but um, about two weeks ago at the Screen Actors Guild Award, there was a uh, sort of a big surprise winner with Denzel Washington winning for Fences. Now, personally, he would be my choice to win. I thought he gave the best performance of the people in the field. Yeah. Um, but the thing that was interesting was that uh, the Screen Actors Guild Award is often a very strong predictor of who goes on to win the Oscars. So that could represent a like a momentum shift mid-season. Um, when it comes down to the wire, I think it's going to be sort of a, a winner by a nose. I have a feeling that Denzel Washington is going to win it at the at the wire by a nose. Um, okay, so we're putting yeah. Brent down for for Francis. Now you know. I want to I want to talk about it just a little bit because I agree. I think Denzel Fences was amazing. His performance was incredible. Just it really was. incredible. But I loved Captain Fantastic and I loved Viggo Mortensen in it. He was just a really quirky character in that movie. It was a little it was so good. I just loved him in it. He really, you know, it really was a, Yeah, it really was a, a very underappreciated movie, but yeah. one of the problems is that I don't think it really has much of a chance because not that many people saw it. Mm, that's um, true. And I know yeah. that shouldn't be, I shouldn't that shouldn't be a factor, but uh, yeah. I mean I believe it's sad. when it was Yeah, I mean when I when it played here in Chicago, I believe it played for a week. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of unusual it played in a major market. Theater here maybe a week and Manchester by the Sea was hard to go and find for me in where I live. La La Land was in every theater. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Fences was at the art theater. So it's kind of like, okay, Hacksaw Ridge was everywhere. Hacksaw Ridge was a great movie. Don't get me wrong. I thought it was a great movie, um, you know, for a true story, which I Yeah, I, I kind of think uh, yeah. Andrew Garfield might be a dark horse in this race. I don't know if yeah. there's quite enough momentum behind his, his, uh, his bid to pull it off, but – um, when the uh, when the controversy involving Casey Affleck surfaced, I think it opened up a little bit of a space for him that he didn't have previously. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think it was a good movie, but I'm not sure that was Oscar worthy performance. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Denzel I think in some ways sure. this is sort of a this is sort of a down payment toward future recognition. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, he's actors will. Work. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the actors will receive nominations as a way of saying, okay, we recognize that at some point down the road you're going to win something. This right. is a way of kind of establishing a, a pedigree want, or, yeah. or uh, you know, uh, something to add to their resume to say, okay, yeah, we can, this person's been nominated before, we'll give them an award this time. Well, let me ask but, you something. La La Land. Like, why did everybody go gaga over La La Land? That's a really like, good question. I didn't question. get it. <laughs> I really, I, we're watching this movie and we're going, huh? Like, it's an okay movie. It's entertaining. But, the best thing that's ever happened since sliced bread? I don't think so. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you on that. I actually wrote a blog on it titled, What Is It With La La Land? Because yeah. I came out of the of theater saying, what's everybody raving about? 
Um, I'll admit it was very technically well made in terms of the production design and the costumes and the cinematography and the choreography. I can't take anything away from any of that. No. Uh, I thought Emma Stone's performance was capable, not outstanding, yeah. but capable. Exactly. It was Emma. Uh, I thought Ryan Gosling was a little bit flat, which was disappointing because I usually like his work. Mm-hmm. But you know, when I, I when I was researching the the blog post. One of the things I was finding from some of the stuff I was seeing online is the reason why a lot of people have gravitated to this is they feel it's like the the movie for the time to help people kind of forget, you know, the woes of the world and the current state of things. Kind of mm-hmm. like the same way people went to the movies during the Depression to forget their everyday worries. Right. And, okay, I can understand that, you know. It's, but all movies do that, really, you know, yeah. don't they? But, yeah. but, but musicals really developed a reputation mm-hmm. for doing that in the 30s. The problem with that is just because it helps you forget your woes and worries for a little while, does that necessarily mean it's going to translate into being, you know, an award-worthy movie? Mm -hmm. And in this case, I don't think so because it's really, in my opinion, it's got a lot of problems with it. I mean, the 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 most egregious of which, to me, was the fact that this is a musical, and the thing you're supposed to remember most about a musical is the music. Exactly, And and there's one song. There's yeah, that one song and, 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 and you know a little bit of something from John Legend there. Um, the let's, music, let's talk I the about was, the, what I thought the music was you know, really pretty forgettable and you know it really was. Five, yeah. You know, five years from now, are people going to be like tapping their toes and humming these songs? I don't think they're going to. No. But, no. Is it, there was like one major song that was it. Ran through yeah. the whole movie. You've heard it in every commercial of the movie, and that's it. Yeah. Who should have been considered? Um, I I like your list of who should have been considered. Let's let's look at that for a moment. Yeah, there's You've a got... lot of people who really should have been considered. I, I really liked um, Joel Edgerton in Loving, mm-hmm. um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt in Snowden, Tom mm-hmm. Hanks in Sully. Uh, no, he Nate did Parker great understated for, performance in that. Yeah, uh, Nate Parker for Birth of a yeah. Nation. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal for, de- uh, for Demolition. Mm-hmm. Uh, Colin Farrell for The Lobster. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you were so weird. That. <laughs> I know it's one of your favorite movies. <laughs> yeah. uh, Taron Edgerton for Eddie the Eagle, which was a surprisingly entertaining early. It was a early, great movie. Yeah, a very entertaining movie. It was. Um, uh, Gail Garcia Bernal for Neruda, which is a film mm-hmm. out of Chile, which was really quite quite fun in a lot of ways. Um, Ethan Hawke for a movie called Born to Be Blue, which really didn't receive a whole lot of attention, but he gives a terrific performance in it. Um, Jesse Plemons for another independent movie called Other People, which unfortunately didn't receive much attention. Yeah. And ironically, Ryan Reynolds for Deadpool. I which, love Deadpool. <laughs> which was such a quirky and fun little movie. And uh, he really showed a range that I didn't know he had. So I always, you know, I always enjoy Ryan Reynolds. There's just something about him that you just have, you fall in love with him. Like he's just fun. Like he's a guy that you want to go hang out with. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Karina, did you see any of those movies? <laughs> no. <laughs> Boy, we have to get you guys to the movies. Come on, listeners. Did you see any of these movies? Give us give us your vote. Okay, let's move on then. Best actress. Best actress, the field we have there is Ruth Nega for Loving, Natalie mm-hmm. Portman for Jackie, Emma Stone for La La Land, Meryl Streep for Florence Foster Jenkins, and Isabel Huppert for Elle. Now, this is also, I believe, kind of a two-horse race at this point, but for different reasons than what happened in the actor category. I think what's happening here is that the, the Academy voters are having to ask themselves, what kind of performance do we want to nominate this year? Mm-hmm. And in that regard, I believe the choice has pretty much come down to either Emma Stone for La La Land or Isabel Huppert for Elle. Now, the choices involved here is do they want to honor what is really the best performance or do they want to honor the one that's the most publicly palatable? Mm-hmm. I think under the current climate, they're going to go for the one that's the most publicly palatable. And in that case, I think the edge has to go to Emma Stone. She's won quite a few of the awards leading up to this. But if they really want to honor what is, to me, the, the best performance, they would give it to Isabel Hubert for Elle. And the thing that's kind of interesting about that is uh, she did win the Golden Globe for Best Lead Actress in a Drama, and she's been nominated in several other competitions. But she plays a character that's really quite unlikable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Plus, it's in a foreign language film, so those, those two yeah, factors no, are kind of blacks. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of work, working against her. But 
um, it was a really gutsy move on her part to take on this role because, um, it, it, as I say, the character is very self-absorbed and very nasty in some ways. Uh, you you, you kind of come out of the theater going, God, she was terrible. But then you have to also say to yourself, and she was so good in the way she portrayed it. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how risky the the academy is going to be in terms of um, picking her part like that to make it the best actress award or not. I wouldn't be disappointed if she wins, but I really think that this is Emma Stone's year at this point because um, uh, she's in a very popular movie. She's sort of a Hollywood darling at the moment in a lot of ways. Um, she should have won a couple of years ago for her supporting performance in Birdman. Um, but, you know, she got passed over in that particular case. So I think maybe the Academy is going to try to make up for it this time. You know, I did not see Jackie, and I'm just tired of seeing movies about Marilyn Monroe and Jackie Kennedy. Like, <laughs> find somebody else. <laughs> well, Natalie Portman really gives a terrific performance in that role. I'm and, sure she does, and she's really a talented actress. And actually, um, very early on in award season, she won the Critics' Choice Award for her performance in that particular movie. Mm. So some people were thinking that, well, maybe she's gonna, you know, she's gonna be the favorite coming into this. But her star kind of faded after that, and uh, nobody's really talking about her very much anymore. I think uh, she's sort of a dark horse, if anybody in the field. So I'm sure uh, I can't ne- think of all the movies I've seen this year, but I'm sure that there's other women who who could have been nominated. There were. Um, you know, a couple of others that readily come to mind are um, uh, Amy Adams for Arrival. Yes. Uh, that's really surprised that she did not get into the field. Uh, a performance that I really loved that was, nobody paid attention to in any of the awards competitions was Rebecca Hall for the movie Christine. Mm-hmm. Um, she was terrific, and nobody she didn't even register on the radar anywhere, unfortunately. Oh, and Sally Field for Hello, My Name Sally is Doris. Field, yeah, that was Hello. great. Mm-hmm. Oh, she was so fun in that. She really, really was. Good, really good performance. Uh, Helen Mirren for Eye in the Sky. She was yeah, another, she you know, was another terrific performance there. And Annette Benning for 20th Century Women, which was not the greatest movie, but her performance was quite good. So yeah, We're going to go to a commercial of... break. You guys think about all of that information Brett's just given you. And when we come back, we are going to move on with the Oscars. Give us a call. 903-787-5887 if you want to put in your vote for who you think should win the Oscars this year. Let's know if you're right. Give us your predictions. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Heck no. We're just getting warmed up. Frankie Sense and more will be right back after we pay the bills. Millen from Ontario, Canada, was driving to a meeting when he saw what looked like a can of cola moving around on the side of the road. Curious, he stopped to investigate and discovered a skunk had gotten its head stuck in a soda can. After a moment of abulia, or indecision, he decided to try and save the potentially woofy animal. Woofy is another word for smelly. He grabbed the can and engaged in dang swaying, or a cooperative tug of war with the skunk all the while hoping he wouldn't get sprayed. Finally, the skunk managed to pop its head out of the can and land safely on the ground. After a brief stare down, the skunk turned and ran into the woods. What's another word for running away in fright? Funkify. It's marching day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Word. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. To lose or maintain your weight, it's valuable to know how many calories you're burning during your exercise. Discovery Health revealed the amount of calories that were approximately burned with these certain exercises. Of course, there are many factors such as your weight, age, speed, etc. that make a difference in the total calories burned, but these are estimates. For a 30-minute workout, you will burn 252 calories by ice skating. Rowing will torch 280 calories, while kayaking will burn 170 calories. Playing tennis will burn 250 to 300 calories, and basketball, 288 calories. Swimming will burn 360 calories, but running is the big winner at 450 calories burned. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. Like us on Facebook.
And we're back. We're here with the Good Radio Network's movie correspondent, Brent Marshaw. We are leading up to the Oscars. He's giving us his predictions. Last year, Brent, what, how, what, did, what did you get? Was it five out of six? I got five out of six. Yeah, really impressive. <laughs> Let's see if we can't beat it this year. Woo. I think we are. I think we're going to get it right on the money. I and if so. you want to get on the money, if you want to win a, a new book, give us, you know, call us. Let us know what your predictions are. We'll tell you if you're right or not. We won't, we won't, we'll make sure you get that book if you beat Brent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so far recapping, let's recap. We have, um, best movie is going to be, or, or best actor is going to be, um, Denzel oh. for Fences. Right. We're saying that, uh, most likely Emma Stone is going to win for La La Land. Yes. And, but you think it should be Isabel Hubert? Yes. And, um, Let's go to Best Supporting Actor next. Okay, so for Best Supporting Actor, the field we have is um, Mahershala Ali for Moonlight, Lucas mm -hmm. Hedges for Manchester by the Sea, Jeff Bridges for Hell or High Water, Deb Patel for Lion, and Michael Shannon for Nocturnal Animals. Mm -hmm. And I think the winner here is going to be Mahershala Ali. I do too. Um, yeah, it's, he, it's been interesting. This category has had a number of different winners in the competitions leading up to the Oscars. Um, but Mahershala Ali, you know, whenever you watch any of the awards broadcasts, he's the one who always draws, it seems to be, like, the biggest round of applause from the people in the audience. Mm -hmm. And he has picked up a couple of the awards up to this point, most notably the Screen Actors Guild Award, again, which I mentioned is a pretty good predictor of who wins at the Oscars. I think he's, uh, his performance is really quite good in playing a very complex character. And in some ways, I think this nomination is – a recognition not only of his individual performance, but it's also he's a, a, like a representative for the entire cast because the cast of this movie was just outstanding. I really wish the Oscars would give out an award for, for Best Ensemble. Some of the other mm -hmm. competitions do, but the Oscars haven't gotten on board with that yet. Um, but I think he's kind of like the like the class representative in some ways yes. in this in this regard. Um, but even still, he, he does give a terrific individual performance as well, and I, I really think that he's going to come up the winner that night. I, I loved Hell or High Water, too. I thought that was a really great movie. And and Jeff Bridges, you know, does Jeff Bridges. <laughs> he, he, yeah, I, I like him, too. And, and the thing is, um, if he had not won a few years ago for Crazy Heart, yeah. Which I, I think loved he might stand Heart. a better chance. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he just won, like I say, he just won not that long ago. And the other ironic thing in this field is his character, he plays kind of a like a redneck Texas sheriff. Mm -hmm. um, his character is almost identical to the character yeah. that Michael Shannon plays in Nocturnal Animals. So, you know, if somebody were an Academy voter and saying, oh, I think I want to, you know, give the supporting award to somebody portraying a Texas redneck sheriff, well, they got two choices. And that would kind of yeah. split the vote between those two. So I think that kind of you know dilutes his chances a little bit. But I agree. I think Moonlight's gonna Moonlight is gonna take it. Mahershala is gonna take it. Now, yeah, Del Patel, Del Patel. Um, if he's the best supporting actor, who was he? The actor in that movie because it was all him. Like, you know, it's funny work? because I thought they nominated the wrong the wrong actor for that movie. I thought the, yeah. the kid, uh, Sonny Powar did a much better job and you know maybe they're thinking well you know he's only five years old who cares you know but i thought you know the first half of the movie and his performance were much far better than the second yeah. half um and i was really kind of shocked that that Deb patel ended up winning the award at the at the british oscars a couple of weeks ago um but then again you know it was People a love competition him. they do they love him and you know well, and it's a British competition, and he's a British a British actor. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. kind of do the math there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. He's done he's done other work that's better than this, and I was a little disappointed to see that he got included in the field when there were like a lot of other people who were really, I thought, much more deserving. And my blog on the subject lists a whole bunch of people who could have qualified easily. Yeah, in my blog. Yeah. and even even in. Um... Uh, Hell or High Water, and it was it was Chris. What was Chris? Um... Oh, Chris Pine and Ben Foster. Yeah, yeah. He, Chris Pine, like he did a really good job in that movie. Yeah, that and was I was really very, Chris Pine. I was really very impressed with Ben Foster. I mean, he's an yeah. actor who I think has been waiting for a breakout role for a long time, and I was hoping that this was going to be the the one to do it for him. But 
Um, he did receive a nomination, I believe, in the Critics' Choice Award competition, but that's the only recognition he received during the, during the award season. So, yeah, hopefully, well, hopefully this will get him recognized for the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well that's good. So. Let's. Um, okay, so who else should have been considered? You, you, uh, oh, there's a whole Hugh bunch Grant, of people. You said? Probably, yeah, probably the best way would, to to look at that would be just to go to my blog page, and you can yeah. see the whole list of people there because. It's a, it's a long list. Support the supporting actor category was a really a great source of terrific performances last year, and I could see where it would be difficult to kind of whittle down the list to just five. Um, I think they could have made a few better choices than they did. I would I would have left out Lucas Hedges and Deb Patel, but um, certainly there were plenty of other people who were qualified. The um, yeah, uh, McKelty Williamson. Oh my God. Oh, he, he was did terrific. a fantastic job in Fences. Like and again, he, he should be, somebody, he should win in my book. I think he was he amazing. Was, yeah, and I mean, it was a performance that again that nobody talked about, yeah. which I find just dumbfounding in so many ways. <laughs> he had me in tears. I just thought he was just brilliant, just brilliant. Yeah, I don't understand, but sometimes you don't understand, and maybe people don't, you know, see the movie. Who knows? But I, I thought he was brilliant. All right, what's next? Okay, so supporting actress. Ooh, uh, the yeah. field there includes Viola Davis for Fences, yes. Naomi Harris for Moonlight, Octavia yes. Spencer for Hidden Figures, Michelle Williams yeah. for Manchester by the Sea, and Nicole Kidman for Lion. And the winner there is Viola Davis, and that's an yes. absolute lock at this point. She's Excellent. Won just she about it. everything. Yeah, she's won just about everything leading up to this, and she really gives you know the performance it deserves to win. Yeah, I, I'm, no, I mean, she, I'm a huge Octavia Spencer fan. Love, 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 love her. Um, and she did a great job, did a great job in Hidden Figures. Great job. But I agree. Viola Davis, by by far. Yeah. Nicole well, to Kidman, me, I'm not I, sure why she was nominated for Lion. And didn't, it was okay. Yeah, I, I referred to her in my blog as a field filler. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I feel bad uh, about I, that but because I do like but her, I, but. I would yeah. have much rather seen uh, Octavia's one of Octavia's co-stars, uh, either Janelle Monae or Taraji P. Henson, nominated yeah. instead. I thought they were both I, much better. Taraji deserved that. She deserved a nomination, and and she would like we talked about this on one of the shows, but she was she was greatly neglected, it, like and it seemed like on purpose, like it was almost like we're purposely not looking at you. You know, Which is like it just because really she felt did like that. receive. She did receive a nomination a few years ago for her supporting performance in The Strange Case of Benjamin Button. Mm -hmm. So it's not like she doesn't have – She's got the chops. Kind of track I, and record I really think it's, it's, it's the TV show. I really think it's her show. Could be. Yeah. It could be. I mean, it, I mean Viola, as, as terrific as she was, she did have some formidable competition in this category, um, yeah. and particularly from uh, Naomi Harris in Moonlight and Michelle Williams in Manchester by the Sea. Um, if Viola weren't in the field, you would see quite a horse race between those two to see who was mm -hmm. going to win the Oscar because both of those performances were really quite good. So, Well, yeah. Okay. Well, we better rush on and, and go to best movie because we're going to be out of time in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, so uh, actually, yeah, actually, in the best director and the best picture categories, I can yep. tell you right out, flat out, in both cases, it's going to be La La Land. Well, yeah. Um, uh, in the director category, Damien Chazelle, he's won virtually everything leading up to the Oscars, so I don't see that going to change. And the best picture category, um, <sighs> Lala oh. Land's been walking away with everything, and I don't see it that has... changing either. Okay, well, I'm going to go with uh, – for me, it's between Moonlight and Fences. Well, for me, um, the, the best picture should go to Moonlight. That yeah. would be my choice. And, I mean, I wouldn't be the least bit disappointed. My prediction was wrong, and there was an upset yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. when we were yeah. pulling it off. Yeah. Um, but I think you have to understand, people have to understand, too, Fences was, was, was directed by Denzel. He was acted by Denzel. Like, I think that he did an amazing job in both of those areas. Well, and then in the director category, I, I would really be very happy to see Barry Jenkins pull off the upset again for Moonlight because I thought he did a tremendous job creating this oh. really terrific movie on a shoestring budget involving a lot of people who didn't act before uh, mm -hmm. and having to seamlessly weave together two characters played by three different actors 
in throughout the course of the movie. Yes. And uh, that was really quite a feat. Yeah. Great, great, great movie. Great movie. Uh, both of them are great movies. I don't know. <laughs> well, we don't have to decide because it's not up to us, is it? It's, no, exactly. up to, it's up to the Academy. But we get to play along with the Academy, and all of you get to play along with us. So give us your predictions. Send them to me if you want. Send them to me at Coach Picasso at Rogers.com and, or to Brent and, and let us know what, what, you, uh, what you're thinking before Sunday because if you do it after, you don't count. <laughs> And if, if listeners want a more detailed account of um, how I'm sizing up the field, go to my blog page at brentmarchant.com and click on the link for who will win this year's Oscars. I look at the top six categories, uh, saying who I think will win, who should win, dark horses, also runs, who should have been left out, and who else should have been considered in each of the top six categories. Um, and, and Damien Chazelle from La La Land, he, he also was uh, involved with Whiplash, which was probably my most favorite movie of 2014. I yeah, it was Whiplash. a much better picture. I, you know, the thing is, because that movie was such a sleeper hit, I think people were willing to bankroll him to do whatever he wanted. Yeah. And my reaction was like, and La La Land is what you came up with? <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah and you know it's funny because you think of it as a musical but is it really like it's not really a musical like one person sings maybe you know uh that's yeah. not how i look at musicals but uh we, we're we we've got less than a minute brent and thank you for coming on and doing the oscar show with me it was so much fun to My have pleasure. you yeah it was a blast and brent brent is with us at the end of the month the last thursday of every month he's here to give uh you his conscious movie guide and um he hasn't steered us wrong yet and you can um be able to read his blog and and read it also on the good radio network's new new blog and new website which will be launched hopefully this week so you'll be able to go to the good radio network.com and read all about everything so how cool is that i'm so excited uh michelle anderson who was our guest on mission unstoppable tuesday you will remember she's making our website for us and i know she's listening so thank you michelle for doing such an outstanding job so quickly we really really appreciate that and if you need her services go to sanctuary uh you can look her up okay well thanks everybody for tuning into frankie sense and more we will be back next Thursday as usual. Brent, again, thank you. And Karina, thanks for producing the show today. And thank each and every one of you for tuning in as you do. Take care now, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.